Hello there. We are going to be continuing our journey to the center of the earth tonight. This is our third reading. We left off last time of following the professor, his nephew, and they had just met Hans in Iceland. So let's go ahead and jump in and get started. Chapter 9. Our start. We meet with adventures by the way. The weather was overcast, but settled, when we commenced our adventurous and perilous journey. We had neither to fear fatiguing heat nor drenching rain. It was, in fact, a real tourist weather. As there was nothing I liked better than horse exercise, the pleasure of riding through an unknown country caused the early part of our enterprise to be particularly agreeable to me. I began to enjoy the exhilarating delight of traveling, a life of desire, gratification, and liberty. The truth is that my spirits rose so rapidly that I began to be indifferent to what had appeared to be a terrible journey. After all, I said to myself, what do I risk? Simply to take a journey through a curious country, to climb a remarkable mountain, and if the worst comes to the worst, to descend into the crater of an extinct volcano. There could be no doubt that this was all this terrible Sacnusum had done. As to the existence of a gallery, or of subterraneous passages, leading to the interior of the earth, the idea was simply absurd, the hallucination of a distempered imagination. All, then, that may be required of me, I will do cheerfully, and will create no difficulty. It was just before we left Reykjavik that I came to this decision. Hans, our extraordinary guide, went first, walking with a steady, rapid, unvarying step. Our two horses with the luggage followed of their own accord, without requiring whip or spur. My uncle and I came behind, cutting a very tolerable figure upon our small but vigorous animals. Iceland is one of the largest islands in Europe. It contains 30,000 square miles of surface and has about 70,000 inhabitants. Geographers have divided it into four parts, and we had to cross the southwest quarter, which was in the vernacular, which in the vernacular is called Sudvester Fjordunger. It's hard to pronounce. Hans, on taking his departure from Reykjavik, had followed the line of the sea. We took our way through poor and sparse meadows, which made a desperate effort every year to show a little green. They very rarely succeed in a good show of yellow, unfortunately. The rugged summits of the rocky hills were dimly visible from the edge of the horizon, through the misty fogs, and every now and then some heavy flakes of snow showed conspicuous in the morning light. While certain lofty and pointed rocks were first lost in the gray low clouds, their summits clearly visible above, like jagged reefs rising from a tr uh, troublous sea. Every now and then a spur of rock came down through the arid ground, leaving us scarcely room to pass. Our horses, however, appeared not only well acquainted with the country, but by kind of instinct knew which was the best road. My uncle had not even the satisfaction of urging forward his steed by whip, spur, or voice. It was utterly useless to show any signs of impatience. I could not help smiling to see him look so big on his little horse. His long legs now and then touching the ground made him look like a six-footed centaur. Good beast, good beast, he would cry. I assure you that I began to think no animal is more intelligent than an Icelandic horse. Snow, tempest, impractical roads, rocks, icebergs, nothing stops him. He is brave, he is sober, he is safe. He never makes a false step, never glides or slips from his path. I dare to say that if any river, any fjord has to be crossed, and I have no doubt there will be many, you will see him enter the water without hesitation like an amphibious animal. 
and reach the opposite side in safety. We must not, however, attempt to hurry him. We must allow him to have his own way. And I will undertake to say that between us, we shall do us our ten leagues a day. We may do so, was my reply. But what about our worthy guide? I have not the slightest anxiety about him. That sort of people go ahead without knowing even what they are about. Look at Hans. He moves so little that it is impossible for him to become fatigued. Besides, if he were to be com complain of weariness, he could have the loan of my horse. I should have a violent attack of a cramp if I were not to have some sort of exercise. My arms are right, but my legs are getting a little stiff. All this while, we are, were advancing at a rapid pace. The country we had reached was already nearly a desert. Here and there could be seen an isolated farm, some solitary burr or Icelandic house built of wood, earth, fragments of lava even, looking like beggars on the highway of life. These wretched and miserable huts excited in us such pity that we felt half disposed to leave alms at every door. In this country there are no roads, paths are nearby unknown, and vegetation, poor as it was, slowly as it receded, reached perfection, soon obliterated all traces of the few travelers which passed from place to place. Nevertheless, this diversion of the province, situated only a few miles from the capital, is considered one of the best cultivated and most thickly peopled in all Iceland. What then must be the state of the less known and the more distant parts of the island? After traveling fully half a Danish mile, we had neither met a farmer at, his, at the door of his hut, nor even a wandering shepherd with his wild and savage flock. A few stray cows and sheep were only seen occasionally. What then must we expect when we come to the upheaved regions? To the, distinct, to the districts broken and roughened from volcanic eruptions and subterraneous commotions. We were to learn this all in good time. I saw, however, on consulting the map, that we were to avoid a good deal of this rough country by following the winding and desolate shores of the sea. In reality, the great volcanic movement of the island and its attendant phenomena are concentrated in the interior of the island. There, horizontal layers or strata of rocks piled upon the other eruptions of basaltic region of origin and streams of lava have given this country a kind of supernatural reputation. Little did I expect, however, the spectacle which awaited us when we reached the peninsula of Sneffels, where agglomerations of nature's ruins form a kind of terrible chaos. Some two or more hours after we left the city of Reykjavik, we reached the little town called Eolkirikja, or the principal church. It, cons it consists simply of a few houses, not what in England or Germany we should call a hamlet. Hans stopped here one half hour. He shared our frugal breakfast, answered yes and no to my uncle's question as to the nature of the road, and at last when asked where we were to pass the night as leonic as usual, garter was his one-worded reply. I took occasion to consult the map to see where Garter was to be found. After looking keenly, I found a small town of that name on the borders of Halfjord, about four miles from Reykjavik, and I pointed this out to my uncle, who made a very energetic grimace. Only four miles out of twenty-two? Why is it only a little walk? He was about to make some energetic observation to the guide, but Hans, without taking the slightest notice of him, 
went in front of the horses and walked ahead with the same imperturbable phlegm he had always exhibited. Three hours later, still traveling over those apparently indeterminable and sandy prairies, we were compelled to go around the Colafjord, an easier and shorter cut than crossing the gulfs. Surely after we entered a place of communal jurisdiction called Yelberg, and the clock of which would have struck twelve if any Icelandic church had been rich enough to possess so valuable and useful an article, these sacred edifices are, however, very much like these people, who do without watches, and never miss them. Here the horses were allowed to make some rest and refreshment, then, following a narrow strip of shore between high rocks and the sea, they took us out. F they took us without further halt to the Alcajord of Branther, and after another mile to Sobur Angnexia, a chapel of ease situated on the southern bank of the Hjalford. It was four o'clock in the evening and we had traveled four Danish miles, about equal to 20 English. The fjord was in this place about a half a mile in width. The sweeping and broken waves come rolling in upon the pointed rocks. The gulf was surrounded by rocky walls, a mighty cliff, 3,000 feet in height, remarkable for its brown strata separated here and there by beds of tufta of a reddish hue. Now whatsoever may have been the intelligence of our horses, I had not the slightest reliance upon them as a means of crossing a stormy arm of the sea. To ride over salt water upon the back of a little horse seemed to me absurd. If they are really intelligent, I said to myself, they will certainly not make the attempt. In any case, I shall trust rather to my own intelligence than theirs. But my uncle was in no humor to wait. He dug his heels into the sides of the steed and made for the shore. His horse went to the very edge of the water, sniffed at the approaching wave, and retreated. My uncle, who was both soothed to say, quite as obstinate as the beast he bestrode, insist up, insisted upon making the desired advance. This attempt was followed by a new refusal on the part of the beast which quietly shook his head. This demonstration of rebellion was followed by a volley of words and a stout application of whipcord, also followed by kips, kicks on the part of the horse, which threw its head and heels upward and tried to throw my uncle. At length, the sturdy little pony, spreading out his legs in a stiff and ludicrous attitude, got from under the professor's leg and left him standing with both feet in a separate stone, like the Colossus of Rhodes. Wretched animal, cried my uncle, suddenly transformed to a foot passenger, as the angry and ashamed, but, uh, and as angry and ashamed as a dismounted cavalry officer on the field of battle. Farja, said the guide, tapping him familiarly on the shoulder. What? A ferry boat? Durr, answered Hans pointing to where lay a boat in question. There. Well, I cried, quite delighted with the information. So it is. Why did you not say so before, cried my uncle. Why not start at once? Tidvatten, said the guide. Uh, what does he say? I asked, considerably puzzled by the delay and the dialogue. He says tide, replied my uncle, translating the Danish word for my information. Of course I understand. We must wait until the tide serves. Forbida? Asked my uncle. Ja, answered Hans. My uncle frowned, stamped his feet, and then followed the horses to where the boat lay. I thoroughly understood and appreciated the necessity for waiting. Before crossing the fjord, for that moment when the sea at its highest point in the state of a slack water, as neither the ebb or flow can then be felt. The ferry boat was in no danger of being carried out to sea or dashed upon the rocky coast. 
The favorable moment did not come until six o'clock in the evening. Then my uncle, myself, and our guide, two boatmen, and the four horses got into a very awkward flat bottom boat. Accustomed as I had been to the stream of ferry boats in the Elbe, I found the long oars of the boatmen but sorry means of locomotion. We were more than an hour in crossing the fjord, but at the length of the passage was concluded without incident. Half an hour later, we reached Gotar. Let's take a drink before we start on the next chapter. Chapter 10. Traveling in Iceland. It ought, one word have thought, to have been night, even in the 65th parallel of latitude, but still the nocturnal illumination did not surprise me. For in Iceland, during the months of June and July, the sun never sets. The temperature, however, was much lower than I expected. It was, I was cold, but even that did not affect me so much as my ravenous hunger. Welcome indeed, therefore, was the hut which hospitably opened its doors for us. It was merely the house of a peasant, but in the matter of hospitality it was worthy of being the palace of a king. As we alighted at the door, the master of the house came forward, held out his hand, and without any further ceremony, signaled us to follow him. We followed him, for to accompany him was impossible. A long, narrow, gloomy passage led to the interior of this habitation, made from beams roughly squared by an axe. This passage gave ingress to every room. The chambers were four in number, the kitchen, the workshop, where the weaving was carried on, and the general sleeping chamber of the family, and the best room to which strangers were especially invited. My uncle, whose lofty stature had not been taken into consideration when the house was built, contrived to knock his head against the beams of the roof. We were introduced into our chamber, a kind of large room with a hard earthen floor, and, a lighted, and lighted by a window, the panes of which were made of some sort of parchment from the intestines of sheep, very far from transparent. The bedding was composed of dry hay thrown into two long red wooden boxes, ornamented with sentences painted in Icelandic. I really had no idea that we should be made so comfortable. There was one objection to the house, and that was the very powerful odor of dried fish, of macerated meat, and of sour milk, which three fragrances combined did not at all suit my olfactory senses. As soon as we had freed ourselves from our heavy traveling costume, the voice of our host was heard calling us in, to come into the kitchen. The only room in which the Icelanders ever make any fire, no matter how cold it may be. My uncle, noting loath, hastened to obey this hospitable and friendly invitation. And I followed. The kitchen chimney was made on an, antique, an, an on antique model. A large stone standing in the middle of the room was the fireplace. Above in the roof was a hole for the smoke to pass through. This apartment was kitchen, parlor, and dining room all in one. On our entrance, our worthy host, as if he had not seen us before, advanced ceremoniously, uttered a word which means, Be happy, and then kissed both of us on the cheek. His wife followed, pronounced the same word with the cer same ceremonial. Then the husband and wife, placing their right hands upon their hearts, bowed profoundly. This excellent Icelandic woman was the mother of nineteen children, who, little and big, rolled, crawled, and walked about in the midst of volumes of smoke arising from the angular fireplace in the middle of the room. Every now and then I could see a fresh white head and a slightly, slightly melancholy expression of countenance peering at me through the vapor. Both my uncle and myself, however, 
were very friendly with the whole party, and before we were aware of it, there were three or four of these little ones on our shoulders, as many on our boxes, and the rest hanging about our legs. Those who could speak kept crying out in every possible and impossible key. Those who did not speak only made all the more noise. This concert was interrupted by the announcement of supper. At this, at this moment, our worthy guide, the Elder Duck, the Eider Duck Hunter, came in after seeing to the feeding and stabling of the horses, which consisted of letting them loose to browse the stunted green of the Icelandic prairies. There was little for them to eat but moss and some very dry, innutritious grass. The next day they were ready before the door. Some time before we were welcome, said Hans. Then tranquilly, with the air of an of automation without any more expression one kiss than another, he embraced the host and hostess and their nineteen children. This ceremony concluded to the satisfaction of all parties. We sat down at the table that is twenty four of us, somewhat crowded. Those who were best off had only two juveniles on their knees. As, so as soon, however, as the inevitable soup placed on the table, the natural uh, tranquility common even to Icelandic babies prevailed over all else. Our hosts filled our plates with a portion of lichen soup of the Iceland moss, off but of by no means a disagreeable flavor, an enormous lump of fish floating in sour butter. After that, there came skur, a kind of curds and whey, served with biscuits and juniper berry juice. To drink, we had blanda, skimmed milk with water. I was hungry, so hungry, that by way of dessert, I finished up with a basin of thick oaten porridge. As soon as the meal was over, the children disappeared. Whilst the grown people sat around the fireplace on which was placed turf, heather, cow dung, and fresh dried fish bones. As soon as everybody was sufficiently warm, a general dispersion took place, all retiring to their respective couches. Our hostess offered to pull off our stockings and trousers according to the custom of the country, but as we graciously de denied, declined to be so honored, she left us to our bed of dry fodder. Next day, at five in the morning, we took our leave of these hospitable peasants. My uncle had great difficulty in making them accept a sufficient and proper remuneration. Hans then gave the signal to start. We had scarcely gotten a hundred yards from Garter than the character of the country changed. The soil began to be marshy and boggy and less favorable to progress. To the right, the range of mountains was prolonged indefinitely, like a great system of natural fortifications of which we skirted the glasses. We met with numerous streams and rivulets, which it was necessary to uh, ford, and that without getting our baggage wet. As we advanced, we deserted appearance. the deserted appearance increased. And yet now and then we could see human shadows flitting in the distance. Then a sudden turn of the track brought us within easy reach of one of these specters. I felt a sudden impulse of disgust at the sight of a swollen head. With shining skin utterly without head, without hair, and whose repulsive and revolting wounds could be seen throughout his rags. The unhappy wretches never came forward to beg. On the contrary, they ran away, not so quick, however, but that Hans was able to salute them with the universal salute. Spetelk, he said. A leper, explained my uncle. The very sound of such a word caused a feeling of repulsion. The horrible reflection, uh, affliction known as leprosy, which has almost vanished before the effects of modern science, is common in Iceland. It is not contagious, but hereditary, so that 
marriage is strictly prohibited to these unfortunate creatures. These poor lepers did not tend to enliven in our journey, the scene of which was inexple inexpressibly sad and lonely. The very last tufts of greasy vegetation, of grassy vegetation, appeared to die at our feet. Not a tree was to be seen except a few stunted willows about as big as blackberry bushes. Now and then we watched a falcon soaring in the gray and misty air, taking his flight towards warmer and sunnier regions. I could not help feeling a sense of melancholy come over me. I sighed for my own native land and wished to be back with Gretchen. We were compelled to cross several little fjords and at last came to a real gulf. The tide was at its height and we were able to go over at once and reach the hamlet of Alfantes, about a mile further on the road. That evening, after fording the Alpha and the Hedda, two rivers rich in trout and pike, we were compelled to pass the night in a deserted house, worthy of being haunted by all of the fays of the Scandinavian mythology. The King of Cold has taken up his residence there and made us feel his presence all night. The following day was remarkable by its lack of any particular incidents. Always the same damp and swampy soil, the same dreary uniformity, the same sad and monotonous aspect of the scenery. In the evening, having accomplished half of our projected journey, we slept in the annexia of Krosselwold. For a whole mile we had under our feet nothing but lava. This disposition of the soil is called Huron. The crumpled lava on the surface was in, in some instances like ship cables, stretched out horizontally, and others coiled up in heaps an immense field of lava came from neighboring mountains, all extinct volcanoes, but whose remains showed that what they once had been. Here and there could be made out of the stream hot water springs. There was no time, however, for us to take more than a cursory view of this phenomena. We had to go forward with what speed we might. Soon the soft and swampy soil again appeared under our feet for our horses. While at every hundred yards we came upon one or more small lakes, our journey was now in a westerly direction. We had, in fact, swept round the great bay of Faxa, and the twin white summits of Snuffles rose to the clouds at a distance of less than five miles. The horses now advanced rapidly. The accidents and difficulties of the soil no longer checked them. I confess that fatigue began to tell severely upon me, but my uncle was firm. It was as firm as was as firm as hard as he had been on the first day. I could not help admiring both the excellent professor and the worthy guide, for they appeared to regard this rugged expe expedition as a mere walk. On Saturday, the 20th of June, at six o'clock in the evening, we reached Buder, a small town picturesquely situated on the shore of the ocean, and here the guide asked for his money. My uncle settled with him immediately. It was now the family of Hans himself. That is to say, his uncles, his cousins, German, who offered us up hospitality. We were exceedingly well received, and without taking too much advance advantage of the goodness of these worthy people, I should have liked very much to have rested with them after the fatigues of the journey. But my uncle, who did not require rest, had no idea of anything of the kind, and despite the fact that next day was Sunday, I was compelled once more to mount my steed. The soil was again affected by the neighborhood of the mountains, whose granite peered out of the ground like tops of an old oak. 
we were skirting the enormous base of the mighty volcano. My uncle never took his eyes off of it. We could not keep from gesticulating and looking at it with the kind of sullen defiance, as much to say, that is the giant I have made up my mind to conquer. After four hours of steadily traveling, the horses stopped of themselves before the door of the Pres Presperity of Stoppy. So, we just finished chapter 10. I'm going to take a quick drink. And so let's continue on to chapter 11. Chapter 11. We reach Mount Sneffels, the Raker. Stoppy is a town consisting of 30 huts built on a large plain of lava exposed to the rays of the sun reflected from the volcano. It stretches its humble tenements along the end of a little ford surrounded by basaltic wall of the most singular character. Basalt is a brown rock of igneous origin. It assumes regular forms which astonish by their singular appearance. Here we found nature proceeding geometrically and working quite after a human fashion, as if she had employed the plummet line, the compass, and the rule. If elsewhere she produces grand artistic effects by pulling up the huge masses without order of connection, if elsewhere we see truncated cones, imperfect pyramids which, with an odd succession of lines, here, as if wishing to give us a lesson in regularity and preceding the architects of the early ages, she has erected a severe order of architecture which neither the splendors of Babylon nor the marvels of Greece ever surpassed. I had often heard of the giant's causeway in Ireland and the Fingal's cave in one of the Hibertides, but the grand spectacle of a real basaltic formation had never yet come to my eyes. This at Stoppy gave us an idea of one in all its wonderful beauty and grace. The wall of the fjord, like nearby the whole of the peninsula, consisted of a series of vertical columns in height about 30 feet. These upright pillars of stone of the finest proportions supported an arc vault of horizontal columns which formed a kind of half-vaulted roof above the sea. At certain intervals and below this natural basin, the eye was pleased and surprised by the sight of oval openings through which the outward waves came thundering in volleys of foam. Some banks of basalt, torn from their fastenings by the fury of the waves, lay scattered on the ground like the ruins of an ancient temple, ruins eternally young over which the storms of ages swept without producing any perceptible effect. This was the last stage of our journey. Hans had brought us along with fidelity and intelligence, and I began to feel somewhat more comfortable when I reflected that he was to accompany us still farther on our way. When we halted before the house of the rector, a small and incom in commodious cabin, neither handsome nor more comfortable than those of its neighbors, I saw a man in the act of shoeing a horse, a hammer in his hand and a leather apron tied around his waist. Be happy, said the eider duck hunter, using his national salutation in his own language. God dog, good day, replied the former in excellent Danish. Your here day, cried Hans, turning around and introducing him to my uncle. The rector, repeated the worthy professor, it appears, my, my dear Harry, 
that this worthy man is the rector and is not above doing his own work. During the speaking of these words, the guide imitated, intimidated the curacured with what was the true state of the case. The good man, ceasing from his occupation, gave a kind of hello upon which a tall woman, almost a giantess, came out of the hut. She was at least six feet high, which in that reason is something considerable. My first impression was one of horror. I thought she had come to give us the Icelandic kiss. I had, however, nothing to fear, for she did not even show much incl inclination to receive us into her house. The room devoted to strangers appeared to me to be far, by far the worst in the presbytery. It was narrow, dirty, and offensive. There was, however, no choice about the matter. The rector had no notion of practicing the usual cordial and antique hospitality. Far from it. Before the day was over, I found we had to deal with the blacksmith, a fisherman, a hunter, a carpenter, anything but a clergyman. It must have been said in his favor that we had caught him on a weekday. Probably he appeared to greater advan he appeared to greater advantage on the Sunday. These poor priests received from the Danish government a most ridiculously inadequate salary and collect one quarter of the tithe of their parish not more than 60 marks current, or about 1.3... Ah. Uh, about L3 10 sterling uh, shillings. Hence the necessity of working to live. In truth, we soon found our host did not count civility among the cardinal virtues. My uncle soon became aware of the kind of man he had to deal with. Instead of a worthy and learned scholar, he found a dull, ill-mannered peasant. He therefore resolved to start on his great expedition as soon as possible. He did not care about fatigue and resolved to spend a few days in the mountains. The preparations for our departure were made the very next day after arrival at Stapi. Hans now hired three Icelanders to take the place of the horses, which could no longer carry our luggage. When, however, these worthy Icelanders had reached the bottom of the crater, they were to go back and leave us to ourselves. This point was settled before they even agreed to start. On this occasion, my uncle partly confided in Hans, the Eiderduck hunter, and gave him to understand that it was his intention to continue his exploration of the volcano to the last possible limits. Hans listened calmly and then nodded to his nodded his head. To go there or elsewhere, to bury himself in the bowels of the earth, or to travel over its summits, it was all the same to him. As for me, amused and occupied by the incidents of travel, I had begun to forget the inevitable future. But now I was once more destined to realize the actual state of affairs. What was to be done? Run away? But if I really had intended to receive Professor Hardwick to his fate, it should have been at Hamburg and not at the foot of Sneffels. One idea above all others began to trouble me. A very terrible idea. One calculated to shake the nerves of a man even less sensitive than myself. Let us consider the matter, I said to myself. We are going to ascend the Sneffels Mountain. Well and good. We are to about to pay a visit to the very bottom of a crater. Good. Still. Others have done it and did not perish from that course. That, however, is not where the whole matter be considered. If a road does really present itself by which to descend into the dark and subterraneous bowels of Mother Earth, if this thrice unhappy Seknussum was really told the truth, we shall be most certainly lost in the midst of a labyrinth of subterraneous galleries of the volcano. Now we have no evidence to prove that Snuffles is really extinct, 
What proof have we that an eruption is not shortly about to take place? Because the monster has slept soundly since 1219, does it follow that he is never to wake? If he does wake, what is to become of us? These were questions worth thinking about, and upon them I reflected long and deeply. I could not lie down in search of sleep without dreaming of eruptions. The more I thought, the more I objected to be reduced to the state of dross and ashes. I could stand it no longer, so I determined at last to submit the whole case to my uncle in the most adroit manner possible, and under the form of some totally irreconcilable hypothesis. I sought him. I laid before him my fears, and then drew back in order to let him get his passion over at his ease. I have been thinking about the matter, he said, in the quietest tone in the world. Uh, what did he mean? Was he at last about to listen to the voice of reason? Did he think of suspending his projects? It was almost too much happiness to be true. I, however, made no remark. In fact, I was only too anxious not to interrupt him and allowed him to reflect on his leisure. After some moments, he spoke out. I have been thinking about the matter, he resumed. Ever since we have been at Stapi, my mind has been almost solely occupied with the grave question which has been submitted to me by yourself. For nothing would be unwiser and more inconsistent than to act with imprudence. I heartily agree with you, my dear uncle, was my somewhat hopeful rejoinder. It is now six hundred years since Snuffles has spoken. But though now reduced to a state of utter silence, he may speak again. New volcanic eruptions are always preceded by perfectly well-known phenomena. I have closely examined the inhabitants of this region. I have carefully studied the soil, and I beg to tell you emphatically, my dear Harry, there will be no eruption at present. As I listened to his positive affirmations, I was stupefied and could say nothing. I see you doubt my word, said my uncle. Follow me. I obeyed mechanically, leaving the presbytery. The professor took a road through the opening of the basaltic, the basaltic rock, which led far away from the sea. We were soon in open country. If we could give such a name to a place all covered with volcanic deposits, the whole land seemed somewhat crushed under the weight of enormous stones, of trap of basalt, granite, lava, and all other volcanic substances. I could see many spouts of steam rising in the air, those white vapors called in the Icelandic tongue rakir, came from hot water fountains and indicate by their violence the volcanic activity in the soil. Now the sight of these appeared to justify my apprehension. I was therefore all the more surprised and mortified when my uncle thus addressed me. You see all this smoke, Henry, my boy? Yes, sir. Well, as long as you see them thus, you have nothing to fear from this volcano. How can that be? Be careful to remember this, continued the professor. At the approach of an eruption, these spouts of vapor redouble their activity to disappear altogether during the pe period of volcanic eruption. For the elastic fluids no longer having the necess necessary tension seek refuge in the interior of the crater instead of escaping through the fissures of the earth. If then the steam remains... In the normal or habitual state, if their energy does not increase, if you add to this the remark that the wind has not replaced by heavy atmospheric pressure and is dead calm, you may be quite sure there is no fear of any immediate eruption. But enough, my boy. When science has sent forth her f fiat, it is only to hear and obey. I came back to the house quite downcast and disappointed, 
my uncle had completely defeated me in his scientific arguments. Nevertheless, I still had one hope. And that was when we, when once we were at the bottom of the crater, that it would be impossible in default of a galley of, or a tunnel to descend any deeper. And this, despite all the learned sacnesums in the world. I passed the whole of the following night with a nightmare on my chest, and after unheard of miseries and torture, found myself in the very depths of the earth from which I was suddenly launched into plan planetary space under the form of an eruptive rock. The next day, June 23rd, the day before my birthday, Hans calmly awaited us outside the presbytery with his three companions loaded with provisions, tools, and instruments, two iron-shod poles, two guns, and two large game bags were reserved for my uncle and myself. Hans, who was a man who never forgot even the minutest precautions, had added to our baggage a large skin full of water as an addition to our gourds. This assured us water for eight days. It was nine o'clock in the morning when we were quite ready. The reactor, the, the rector, and his huge wife or servant, I never really knew which, stood at the door to see us off. They appeared to be about to inflict us inflict on us the usual final kiss of the Icelanders to our supreme astonishment. Their ado took the shape of a formidable bill, in which they even accounted the use of the pastoral house. Really and truly the most abominable and dirty place I ever was in. The worthy couple cheated and robbed us like a Swiss innkeeper, and made us feel by the sum we had to pay the splendors of their hospitality. My uncle, however, paid without bargaining. A man who had made up his mind to undertake a voyage into the interior of the earth is not a man to haggle over a few miserable rix dollars. This important matter, matter settled, Hans gave the signal for departure, and some moments later we had left Stapi. And that is the end of chapter 11. So we're going to continue on to chapter 12. And after chapter 12, we'll probably call it a night. Chapter 12, The Ascent of Mount Sneffels. The huge volcano, which was the first stage of our daring experiment is above 5,000 feet. Sneffels is the termination of a long range of volcanic mountains of a different character to the system of the island itself. One of its peculiarities is its two huge pointed summits. From whence we started, it was impossible to make out the real outlines of the peak against the gray field of sky. We all could distinguish... All we could distinguish was a vast dome of white which fell downwards from the head of the giant. The commencement of the great undertaking filled me with awe. Now that we had actually started, I began to believe in the reality of the undertaking. Our party formed quite a procession. We walked in single file, preceded by Hans, the imperturbable Eider Duck Hunter. He calmly led us by narrow paths where two persons could no by no possibility walk abreast. Conversation was wholly impossible. We had all the more opportunity to reflect and admire on the awful grandeur of the scene around. Beyond the extraordinary basaltic wall of the fjord of Stapi, we found ourselves making our way through the fibrous tuff, over which grew a scanty vegetation of grass, the residuum of the ancient vegetation of the swampy peninsula. The vast mass of this combustible, the field of which is yet, as yet is utterly unexplored, would suffice to warm Iceland for a whole 
century. This mighty turf pit measured from bottom to certain ravines is often not less than 70 feet deep and presents to the eye the view of successive layers of black burnt up rocky detritus separated by thin streaks streaks of porous sandstone the grandeur of the spectacle was undoubted as well as the arid and deserted air as a true nephew of the great Professor Hardwig, and despite my preoccupation and doleful fears of what was to come, I observed with great interest the vast collection of mineralogical curiosities spread out before me in this vast museum of natural history. Looking back to my recent studies, I went over and thought the whole geological history of Iceland. This extraordinary and curious island must have made its appearance from out of the great world of waters at a comparatively recent date. Like the coral islands of the Pacific, it may, for aught we know, be still rising by slow, imperceptible degrees. If this is really the case, its origin can be contributed to only one cause, that of the continued action of subterranean fires. This was a happy thought. If so, if this were true, away with the theories of hu Sir Humphrey Davy, away with the authority of the parchment of Arnsucknesum, the whole pretensions to discovery on the part of my uncle and to our journey, all must end in smoke. Charmed with the idea, I began more carefully to look about me. A serious study of the soil was necessary to to negative or confirm my hypothesis. I took in every item of what I saw, and I began to comprehend the succession of phenomena which had preceded its formation. Iceland, being absolutely without sedimentary soil, is composed exclusively from volcanic tuffa. That is to say, of an agglomeration of stones and of rocks and of porous texture. Long before the existence of volcanoes, it was composed of a solid body of a massive trap rock lifted bodily and slowly out of the sea by the action of centrifugal force at work in the earth. The internal fires, however, had not as yet burst their bounds and flooded the exterior cake of Mother Earth with hot and raging lava. My readers must excuse this brief and somewhat pedantic geological le lecture, but it is necessary to the complete understanding of what follows. At a later period in the world's history, a huge and mighty fissure must, reason reasoning by analogy, have been dug diagonal diagonally from the southwest to the northeast of the island through which by degrees flowed the volcanic crust. The great and wondrous phenomenon then went on without violence. The outpouring was enormous, and the seething fused matter ejected from the bowels of the earth spread slowly and peacefully in the form of a vast level plains, or what are called mammalins, or mounds. It was at this epoch that the rocks called feldspars, sedonites, or and porphyries starred appeared. But as natural consequences of this overflow, the depth of the island increased. It can readily be believed what an enormous quantity of elastic fluids were pulled up within its center when at last it afforded no other openings after the process of cooling the crust had taken place. At length, at length a time came when despite the enormous thickness and weight of the upper crust, the mechanical forces of the combustible gases below became so great that they actually upheaved the weighty back and made for themselves a huge and gigantic shafts. Hence the volcanoes which suddenly arose through the upper crust 
and next the craters which burst forth at the summit of these new creations. It will be seen that the first phenomena in, this, in connection with the formation of the island were simply eruptive. To these, however, shortly succeeded the volcanic phenomena. Through the newly formed openings escaped the marvelous mass of basalt basaltic stones with which the plain we are now crossing was covered. We were trampling our way over heavy rocks of gray color, which, while cooling, had been molded into six-sided prisms. In the back distance, we could see a number of flattened cones, which formerly were so many fire-vomiting mouths. After the basaltic eruption was appeased and set at rest, the volcano, the force of which increased with that of the extinct craters, gave free passage to the fiery overflow of lava and to the mass of cinders and pumice stone now scattered over the sides of the mountain, like disheveled hair on the shoulders of a Bacante. Hmm. Here, in a nutshell, I had the whole history of phenomena from which Iceland rose. All take their rise in the fierce action of interior fires, and to believe that the, inter the central mass did not remain in a state of liquid lava, white hot, and simply and purely madness. This being satis satisfactorily proved, what insensate folly eh, to pretend to penetrate the interior of the mighty earth. This mental lecture delivered to myself while proceeding on a journey did me good. I was quite reassured to the fate of our enterprise, and therefore went, like a brave soldier mounting a bristling battery, to the assault of old Sneffels. As we advanced, the road became very moment, became every moment more difficult. The soil was broken and dangerous. The rocks broke and gave way under our feet and we had to be scrupulously careful in order to avoid dangerous and constant falls. Hans advanced as calmly as if he had been walking over Salisbury Plain. Sometimes he would disappear behind a huge blocks of stone, and we momentarily lost sight of him. There was a little period of anxiety, and then there was shrill, a shrill whistle just to tell us where to look for him. Occasionally, he would take it in, into his head to stop to pick up lumps, lumps of rocks and silently pile them into small heaps in order that we might not lose our way back down on our return. He had no idea of the journey we were about to undertake. At all events, the precaution was a good one, though now utterly useless and unnecessary. But I must not anticipate. Three hours of terrible fatigue, walking incessantly, had only brought us to the foot of the great mountain. This will give some notion as to what we will still undergo. Suddenly, however, Hans cried a halt. That is, he made signs to that effect, and a summary kind of breakfast was laid out on the lava before us. My uncle, who now was simply Professor Hardwig, was so eager to advance that he bolted his food, food like a greedy clown. His halt for refreshment was also a halt for repose. The professor was therefore compelled to wait a good measure of his imperturbable guide, who did not give the signal for departure for a good hour. The three Icelanders, who were as tacticurn as their comrade, did not say a word, but went on eating and drinking very quietly and soberly. From this, our first real stage, we began to ascend the slopes of the Sneffels volcano. Its magnificent, snowy, snowy nightcap, as we began to call it, by an 
optical illusion very common in the mountains appeared to be as close at hand, and yet how many long, weary hours must elapse before we reach its summit? What unheard of fatigue must we endure? The stones on the mountainside, held together by no cement of soil, bound together by no roots of creeping herbs, gave way continuously under our feet and went rushing below into the plains like a series of small avalanches. In certain places, the sides of this stupendous mountain were at an angle so steep that it was impossible to climb upwards, and we were compelled to get round these obstacles as best as we might. Those who understand alpine climbing will comprehend our difficulties. Often we were obligated to help each other along by means of our climbing poles. I must say this for my uncle, that he stuck as close to me as possible. He never lost sight of me, and on many occasions his arm supplied me with a firm and yet solid support. He was strong, wiry, and apparently insensible to fatigue. Another great advantage with him was that he had the innate sentiment of equilibrium, for he never slipped or failed in his steps. The Icelanders, through heavy, though heavily loaded, climbed with the agility of mountaineers. Looking up every now and then at the height of the great volcano of Snuffles, it appeared to me wholly impossible to reach the summit on that side. At all events, if the angle of inclination did not speedily change. Fortunately, after an hour of unheard of fatigues and the gymnastic exercise that we had been trying to an acrobat, we came to a vast field of ice which wholly surrounded the bottom cone of the volcano. The natives called it the tablecloth probably some such reason as the dwellers in the Cape of Good Hope call their mountain Table Mountain, and their roads Table Bay. Here, to our mutual surprise, we found an actual flight of stone steps, which wonderfully assisted our ascent. The singular flight of stairs was like everything else, volcanic. It had been formed by one of the torrents of stones cast up by the eruptions, and of which the Icelandic name is Stina. If this singular torrent had not been checked in its descent by the particular shape of the flanks of the mountain, it would have swept into the sea and would have formed new islands. Such as it was, it served us admirably. The abrupt, abrupt character of the slopes momentarily increased. But these remarkable stone steps, a little less difficult than those of the Egyptian pyramids, were of the simple means by which lava were enabled. We were enabled to proceed. About seven in the evening of that day, after ha having clambered up two thousand of these rough steps, we found ourselves overlooking a kind of spur or projection of the mountain a sort of buttress upon which the cone-like crater, properly so called Iceland, uh, upon which the cone-like crater, properly so called, leaned for support. The ocean lay beneath us at a depth of more than 3,200 feet, a grand and mighty spectacle. We had reached the region of eternal snows, the cold was keen, searching and intense. The wind blew with extraordinarily violent, extraordinary violence, and I was utterly exhausted. My worthy uncle, the professor, saw clearly that my legs refused further service and that, in fact, I was utterly exhausted. Despite his hot and feverish impatience, he decided with a sigh upon a halt. He called the eider duck hunter to his side. That worthy, however, shook his head. Offendor, he's, was his sole spoken reply. It appears, said my uncle with a woebegone look, that we must go higher. 
He then turned to Hans and asked him to give some reason to for this decisive response. Mister, replied the guide. Ja, mister. Yes, the mis mister, cried one of the Icelandic guides in a terrified tone. It was the first time he had spoken. What does this mysterious word signify? I anxiously inquired. Look, said my uncle. I looked down upon the plain and I saw a vast and prodigious volume of pulverized pumice stone of sand and dust rising to the heavens to form it a mighty water spout it resembled the fearful phenomenon of a similar character known to the travels travelers in, in the great desert of the great sahara the wind was driving it directly towards the side of snuffles on which we were perched this opaque veil standing up in between us and the sun projected a deep shadow on the flanks of the mountain if this sand spout broke over us we must all be infallibly infallibly destroyed crushed in its fearful embraces this extraordinary phenomenon very common when the wind shakes the glaciers and sweeps over the arid plains is the Icelandic tongue for Mr. Hostig, Hostig, called our guide. Now I certainly knew nothing of Danish, but I thoroughly understood that his gestures were meant to quicken us. The guide turned rapidly in a direction which would take us to the back of the crater, all the while ascending slightly. We followed rapidly despite our excessive fatigue. A quarter of an hour later, Hans paused to enable us to look back. The mighty whirlwind of sand was spreading up the slope of the mountain to the very spot we had proposed to halt. Huge stones were caught up and cast into the air and thrown about as during an eruption. We were happily a little out of the direction of the wind and therefore out of the reach of danger. But before the precaution, but for the precaution and knowledge of our guide, our dislocated bodies, our crushed and broken limbs, would have been cast to the wind like dust from some unknown meteor. Hans, however, did not think it prudent to pass the night on the bare side of the cone. We therefore continued our journey in a zigzag direction. The 1,500 feet which remained to be accomplished took us at least five hours. The turnings and windings, the no, no thoroughfares, the marches and marches, turn that insignificant distance into at least three leagues i have never felt such misery fatigue and exhaustion in my life i was ready to faint from hunger and from cold the rare field air at the same time painfully acted upon my lungs at last when i thought to myself at my last gasp about eleven at night it being that in that region quite dark, we reached the summit of Mount Sneffels. It was an awful mood of mind that, despite my fatigue, before I descended into the crater which was to shelter us for the night, I paused to behold the sunrise at midnight, on the very day of its lowest declina declination, and enjoyed the spectacle of its ghastly pale rays cast upon the isle which lay sleeping at our feet. I no longer wondered at people traveling all the way from England to Norway to behold this magical and wondrous spectacle. And that is the end of chapter 12. So that is where we are going to end it. So I thank you very much for joining me. Once again, if you liked this reading, please click on the little heart, let me know what you liked, and then click the subscribe button, and then you'll be notified when we go live next. Or not live, but you get a recording. And I'll see you on the next video. You have a good night. Sleep well.